My name is Matt Simon. I'm a legislative analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project. Thanks so much for coming. Obviously, the highlight of this press conference is the fact that we have federal medical marijuana patient Urban Rosenfeld here today. First, I want to introduce prime sponsor of Senate Bill 409, Senator Jim Forsyth, for a brief remarks. Thank you. It's uh, certainly an honor to be here with Herb today. Um, I think you'll hear from his story uh, what a compelling story it is and how it really reveals how hard it is to work with the federal government to get something done on this issue, how much resistance you wind up facing, and also just how hypocritical they are. Uh, a lot of people with this legislation are saying we should wait for the federal government to do something. Well, the federal government has had a medical marijuana program and uh, they've had it active. Um, and yet at the same time they're telling the states that we can't do it, and I think that's very hypocritical. Um, so we did invite law enforcement here this morning, unfortunately they weren't able to make it. Um, it's been frustrating for me, uh, I, I am very, I'm very um, convinced that law enforcement can handle coming up with a bill that they can uh, implement or uh, make sure to police and make sure there's not abuse and they can uh, sufficiently handle any potential abuses just like they do in prescription drugs currently. We've done a lot of work with law enforcement this year to try to curb prescription drug abuse. Uh, and if they were fearful of abuse in this program, and uh, I'm sure they could work to, to solve that issue by working together with us. So I urge them to continue to um, try to work with us. And uh, with that, do you want to introduce her? I will. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator Forsyth. Yeah, one of the arguments that we hear most often, you know, by people who are convinced that marijuana has medicinal benefits is, well, you need to go to Washington. You need to change the law there. And of course, we all agree with that. We want to change the laws in Washington. They won't listen. And the gentleman who's about to speak, his life story is a battle of fighting the federal government. He's been fighting the federal government to change that law longer than I've been alive. And so the emphasis is from a patient perspective. I just want to acknowledge some of the patients that, have, that are here today before I introduce our speaker. We have Dennis Acton on the end from Fremont. He's a cancer survivor. Uh, Ted Wright from Tuckton Borough. His wife's been battling breast cancer for 19 years. Uh, Kirk McNeil from New Hampshire Common Sense. Representative Merrick. Um, we have Ellen McClough who has multiple sclerosis. And Dick Vincent also with multiple sclerosis. And now I'm going to introduce, all the way from Florida, Urban Rosenfeld, author of the book, My Medicine. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in New Hampshire, and thank you for inviting me up here. Now, my name is Urban Rosenfeld. I have a bone disorder called multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis, and a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. It's a mouthful. It means bone tumors on the end of long bones. I have them all throughout my body, approximately 200 bone tumors. At age 10, when I was diagnosed with this, they told me there was a good chance I wouldn't outlive my teenage years. I was sent to Boston Children's Hospital, which is the center for this disorder, and there I learned how to take care of myself. I had numerous operations with tumors removed, and I survived. I was an advocate against illegal drugs because why would a healthy person use illegal drugs? This was in the 60s. When I had to take all these legal drugs, morphine, quaalude, Valium, butazole, and alka, virosol, you name it, I took it. Went to college in 71, into Miami, to school, from Virginia, and I'm from Virginia, by the way. That's important, I think Virginia and New Hampshire are very similar in, in aspects. I mean, your, your, your motto is, is live free or die. When I discovered medical cannabis was the best medicine for me, I decided I wasn't a criminal, I was a patient. If the federal government outlawed it, then the federal government should be the one to supply it. So I took on the federal government. And one of the aspects I used in my, in my arguing about it is Patrick Henry, give me liberty, give me death. So Virginia and New Hampshire are very similar. It took me 10 years of educating the federal government. But finally in 1982, with the help of the University of Virginia Law School, with the help of my state, with the governor, with the head of the Crime Commission, the head of the state police, all helping me. Because as they said, we're not here to harm patients. We're here to stop crime. And there's a difference between marijuana and medical cannabis. So I was able to have hearings before FDA, and in 1982, I won. I became the second person in the United States that the United States federal government grows medical cannabis for me and supplies me on a daily basis. Now, with a show of hands, real quick, how many of y'all pay federal taxes? Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for paying for my medicine for almost 30 years. I appreciate it. I use 10 to 12 cannabis cigarettes per day. I use no other medications. I use no morphine, nothing at all. I haven't for over 22 years. 
And because I have the right medicine, I get no euphoric effect. As a living, I'm a stockbroker in Fort Lauderdale. I handle a lot of money on a daily basis. On Saturdays, I teach at an organization called Shake a Leg in Miami, Coconut Grove. We teach disabled, mentally, physically, and economically challenged children and adults how to sail adaptive sailboats. We have chairs built on the boat, and we take paraplegics, quadriplegics, and they sail the boat. It's very rewarding. I'm able to do all this because I have the right medicine. Now, when you say the feds are the ones that control this, yeah, the feds are the ones that control this. And I hate these state laws. I think what y'all are doing is ridiculous. Okay? This was federal policy. It should be federal law. The feds have had their opportunity, and they failed. In 1986, there were hearings ordered by, by courts that FDA held for Judge Francis Young, their own law review judge. They held two years for the hearings, and at the end of two years, he stated that it was one of those benign substances known to mankind, and it should be made of medicine. The feds didn't care. And that's the problem. The feds don't care. So in 1996, individual states started passing their own laws. And while I'm against these individual laws, I applaud what they're doing. It's a shame they have to do it, but you do. Because the feds are not going to do it. They're controlled by lobby organizations, by the pharmaceutical lobby, by the lumber lobby, by the petrochemical lobby. Because again, cannabis, hemp, same product. One's medical, one's industrial. Okay, so therefore, if medical marijuana became available tomorrow, nationwide, I'd be on the phone to my clients saying, sell your drug stocks, because people wouldn't need the drugs. That's why the pharmaceutical industry is against it. There are 80% of the populations in favor of medical cannabis. Normally, when 80% of a population is in favor of something, the politicians listen, because they, want, they listen to people. They're supposed to. Well, guess what? They don't on this subject. Okay, if, eight, if tomorrow medical cannabis became available in this country, the 80% of the population that's in favor of it would gain nothing monetarily, not a dime. But what about the 20% that's against us? They would lose a fortune. That's the reason why we don't have a law. So therefore, we need each and every state to say to the federal government, we're tired of arresting our sick patients. We're tired of wasting money arresting people that are patients that should not be arrested because of some, some weed that the federal government's been growing since 1968 on the campus of University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi. They grow the cannabis there. They ship it to Raleigh, North Carolina, Raleigh Research Triangle. They put it in cigarette form. Here it is, 300 cigarettes per tin can. They ship it to a pharmacy for me. It's the University of Miami, Baskin Palmer. They ship it to there. And every 25 days, I go down there and I pick up a tin can of cannabis. 300 cigarettes, nine ounce, well, seven ounces, and I go through nine ounces a month. Now, anybody else in this country that has this is breaking federal law, and they can be arrested. I am three of the people, the only four people in the United States that cannot be touched. We're not breaking any federal law. So what you're doing is you're going to pass a state law that's still going to be going against federal government. That's okay, because the feds aren't going to come in and bust you. If they do, then there's avenues for that. But what your message you're sending by passing a law saying, hey, to the feds, we've waited. You're not doing anything to help our patients. So we're going to do something ourselves. So this is what's important, to be able to put medicine in the hands of physicians. Your doctors go to school for 12 years in the state. Your state allows them to become physicians. You allow them to prescribe whatever they want to prescribe. And that's their right. If there's a problem with that, the medical board comes in, or law enforcement. Well, that's the same with this. If a physician recommends medical cannabis for a patient under your new state law, then that's their job. Let them do their job, okay? I'm a member of an organization called Patients at a Time. We're the only organization in the United States, the only organization that is sanctioned by the American Medical Association, the largest physician organization in the country. We're sanctioned by them to teach doctors about medical cannabis, to where they come to our conference every two years or go to our website and download our previous conference and they get continuing education credit. Well, why would they get continuing education credit if it's not a medicine? Because everybody who's against us says, well, it's not a medicine. Well, just ask them where they got their medical degree from. Because the American Medical Association sanctions us to teach them. And also the American Nurses Association. Gee, the largest nursing organization in the United States. Well, if it's not a medicine, why would they want nurses to learn about it? They sanction patients at a time to teach nurses to where they get continuing education credit. Well, why would they if it's not a medicine? Gee, why are they wasting their time? And what about the Veterans Administration? Good organization, veterans. Do we care about our veterans in this country? I like to think we do. Well, guess what, folks? If you don't have a law in your books 
go to every politician in this state and ask them straight up, why are you against our veterans? Why are you against our veterans? And what's a politician going to say? Hey, I'm not against veterans. They can't be against veterans. Well, guess what? You are against veterans until you pass a law like what y'all are trying to do in the state. Because the VA has stated this through our organization's education, that if you're a veteran and you've been from Afghanistan or whatever and you've had a leg blown off or whatever and you're taking opiates for pain and you go to a VA hospital and they do a blood test or a urinalysis on you and it shows metabolites of cannabis in your system, well, guess what? The VA has instructed their doctors to cease treating veterans unless you're in a state that allows it. If you're in a state that has a medical marijuana law, then you're fine. The veteran can be treated. No problem if they test positive for cannabis. But if you're in a state such as New Hampshire, such as my home state of Virginia, my adopted state of Florida, that veteran cannot be treated because there is no law in the books allowing a, a, a physician to treat a veteran for this. So again, I repeat, until you pass a law, until it's passed and the governor signs the law, ask your governor, governor, why are you against our veterans? Because you are until you pass a law. So what I'm here to do today is to try to show you that it's not the hysteria that people make it out to be. It's a very benign substance. Now, unlike most people, I get no euphoric effect. I get no high. I never have. We've discovered, scientists have discovered that every person Every animal has an endocannabinoid system throughout their body. We produce natural cannabis in our body. Everybody does. And we need the substance. Before it was outlawed in 1937, cannabis was a, a normal part of our diet. The medicines were made of it. Our foods were, had it in there. In 1937, they outlawed it. They outlawed it for a political reason. The people that were in charge were worried about blacks and Mexicans proliferating and taking over the country for voting rights. So how can we keep them from happening? They said, well, 1937, they're the only people that smoke marijuana and a few jazz musicians. Other than that, nobody smokes marijuana. If we outlaw marijuana, we can take away their voting rights. Well, that was what was brought up. And you know, the people in charge then of the government was people like DuPont. Well, he'd just come out with Rayon and Nalon. He thought, well, gee, if we can outlaw marijuana, we can outlaw hemp. And hemp's my biggest comp comp competition. If we outlaw hemp, then people will buy, you know, my petrochemicals, Nalon, Rayon. Then you had Hearst, who owned all the major newspapers, owned all kinds of forest land through Mexico, United States, all over the world. He said, gee, if we could outlaw marijuana, we could outlaw hemp, and people would have to use my lumber for paper. So you have lobby organizations for that. You have the cotton industry that didn't want to see hemp. So all these organizations were against marijuana because of their own political reasons or their own financial reasons. Today, it's outlawed. We've got 17 states that have passed laws in this country. Over a third of the nation now, people are protecting their state. I want to see New Hampshire become the 18th state. I want to see their citizens not have to worry about being arrested. Because, like him, he's got MS. Okay, well, to me, he, he kind of looks like a law-abiding citizen. You know? But maybe I should say this. You know? Maybe I should say, you know something? He's breaking your state law. He should be arrested. He should be put behind bars, and we would sleep better at night knowing he's behind bars. Because he's breaking your state law. I don't know. Look at him. Would we sleep better at night knowing he's behind bars? I don't know. I, I, he doesn't look that bad to me. Okay, so therefore, we need to change the law. And what you all have done is try to change the law. Your House has passed it. Your Senate's passed it. Your governor, for whatever reason, doesn't want to vote on it. Doesn't want to pass it. Now, the reason I've been given is because his wife, who's a pediatrician, doesn't think it's necessary. Doesn't think it's needed. We know no medicine is going to be approved by 100% of any physicians. Now, she's a pediatrician, a retired pediatrician. My great uncle, Dr. Shipley Glick, was head of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. The head, he taught pediatrics. He was in charge. My regular uncle, Dr. Sigmund Stein, from New London, Connecticut, he taught pediatrics at Yale. Pretty good guy. They were both in favor of me taking on the federal government. And they were pediatricians. So not every doctor is going to agree on every medicine. But what doctors got to realize is there's organizations such as the AMA that says doctors need to learn about this. So to your governor, what I want to say to him is be open-minded. You allow physicians to go to school for 12 years. You allow them to become doctors in your state. You allow them to prescribe OxyContin or other medicines. And if they do something wrong, that's what the medical board's for. And if a patient does something wrong, that's what the police are for. But the police 
should not be making medical decisions. Let your doctors do that. So that's why it's so important why I come up here, because there's only four of us in the country that can stand up and talk about it. Doctors, it's very difficult for them to talk about medical cannabis. Why? Because DEA comes in on them and says, hey, doctor, we need to look at every prescription you've written for the last two years. It's like an IRS doctor. So they're scared to talk about it. Patients, well, he's, he's potentially be arrested. If he right now had cannabis on him, then if a police officer in the room that says that gentleman over there, he could actually go and arrest him. But guess what? This police officer cannot arrest me. I'm under federal law. Federal law supersedes state law. So I'm one of the few people in the country that can stand up and say, hey, this is a medicine. This works. I'm living proof. I've been receiving this for over 29 years. I've been using medical cannabis, 10 to 12 cannabis cigarettes per day, for 41 years. So when the federal government says it's not a medicine, I beg to differ. Okay, that's why I'm here. I'm here to say that, you know, people can talk about how bad it is. People can talk about how good it is. I can legally stand up and say, I can tell you exactly how good it is because I've used it. So I'm hoping that your governor thinks about what he's doing and realizes that, you know something? He's a governor. Okay, the people have spoken. The House has passed it, the Senate's passed it. People have spoken. He's not an expert on the subject. His wife's a physician. God bless her. We need physicians. Okay? But what we have to realize is that as a governor, he is not a physician. Okay? He did not get a medical degree at any university. His wife did, but his wife is a physician. And the American College of Physicians, the AMA, American Medical Association, the American Nurse Association, the Veterans Administration, they all say it's a medicine. So no matter what she feels, I think she has to realize that as a physician, medicine needs to be put in the hands of physicians. So therefore, it's important that the state of New Hampshire join over a third of the country and take the crime away from their patients so they don't have to waste taxpayers' money arresting sick people. And they can put medicine in the hands of physicians, which is where it should be, you know, not in the policeman's hands. I mean, right now, if I go outside to my car and the car that my suitcase is in is broken into, I'm not going to call my doctor. I'm going to call the police. Vice versa, if I get sick tomorrow, I'm not going to call the police. I'm going to call my doctor. So put medicine back in the hands of physicians. Let them be the ones to decide. And if they abuse it, if they do something wrong, that's what laws are for. That's why the medical community has medical board. That's why the police have their right to do what they want to do. And I'm hoping by putting hands and putting medicine in the hands of physicians that you all have a much healthier population. And people such as, such as him will have the right medicine to where maybe if they're on disability, they become members, productive members of society, like myself. Because if I was still alive, I wouldn't be working. I wouldn't be before you today. I'd be homebound in Fort Lauderdale just trying to figure out how to get out of bed. Instead, I'm a very productive member of society. I'm, I'll be 60 years old next month. In fact, I just did a story for Australian TV, the number one rated show last week that came down. We're, we're doing a program called The Silver Tour, which is teaching, especially in South Florida, elderly citizens, senior citizens, about the benefits of medical cannabis. And the number one show in Australia heard about us, and they flew a camera crew over. And of course, I'm, I'm very vocal on, on videos and everything else. And the producer for the Australian TV called me up and said, Urban, we've got a problem with you. And I go, what's the problem? He said, well, this is a show on senior citizens. And I hate to ask you this, but how old are you? I said, I'm 59. They go, thank God. We thought you were like 45. <laughs> this, to me, is a fountain of youth. Okay, I don't look my age because I've smoked this for 41 years. We have an endocannabinoid system in our body. We're all just learning this. This is not being taught in medical schools yet. We've learned this in the last 20 to 25 years. Everybody's heard of endorphins in this country. Well, 40 years ago, nobody heard of it because it wasn't taught in medical schools. So right now, when I talk about the endocannabinoid system, or the cannabinoid receptors that all of us have, millions and millions of cannabinoid receptors, it's all foreign to y'all. It's all foreign to doctors because they're not teaching yet in medical schools. But yet, the top medical organizations know about it. And they're saying they want their doctors and nurses to learn about it. So that's why I'm here to teach all about it. And say, hey, look, I'm not a physician. Not at all. But I'm a patient who's been doing this for 41 years, 30 under the federal government. So I hope that y'all will educate your governor and that the governor will end up signing the bill. And if not, I do hope that we'll be able to override his veto. Any questions?
By the way, I'm a veteran. <laughs> You're a veteran? Oh, God, even worse. Even worse, man. I tell you, you should be 100, of course. <laughs> so, thank you all very much, and I appreciate being here. Oh, by the way, I have my book. Yeah, my book educates everybody. This is the this is the Bible. Okay, if you want to learn about the medical cannabis movement in this country, this book of mine, My Medicine: How I Convinced the U.S. Government to Provide My Marijuana and Help Launch the National Movement, gives you the entire history on the medical cannabis movement in this country, as seen through me, my eyes, the longest surviving patient. You learn what Clinton has felt about it and different administrations and uh, what transpired all these years and how we got to the point where y'all are trying to pass a law here in New Hampshire. Where, where is the book available? It's available but for me to hear today and it's also available from uh, my website mymedicinethebook.com. You can order, order autographed copies. Thank you. Great. Thanks everybody. And the difference is that medical cannabis is a medicine, okay? And the American Medical Association has sanctioned this. The American Nurses Association has sanctioned this. The Veterans Administration has sanctioned this. So therefore, the people that are saying it's not a medicine are not educated. Uh, it is a medicine, okay? I have a severe bone disorder. I have multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. To me, this is a medicine. To many, many thousands of patients, this is a medicine. There might be alternative motives. There are, are some people that think that you know, medical use might lead to legalization. But you know, we don't have time. Patients do not have time to wait for the legalization issue. It's a medicine. The AMA, the ANA sanction it. They want their doctors and nurses to learn about this. We are the only organization of patients at a time, my organization, that is allowed to teach doctors and nurses about medical cannabis, where they get continuing education credit. So again, if the AMA and the ANA sanction it to be able to learn about it, then it is a medicine. Okay, they sanction it, and that's why I'm here. I'm just thankful to be here in New Hampshire, and I hope the governor comes to realize that this is a medicine and that physicians are the ones who decide medicine in this country. So it should be up to physicians to whether they want to recommend it or not. They should have the right.